Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We are looking at our summer series uh, called Missio Dei, the great sending, looking at the mission of God. And we, we're, we're seeing in all these different texts as, as Jesus teaches, as Jesus lives out his life, he's on a mission to seek and to save, and he invites you and me to be part of that mission. So, so each week we're looking at a, a, a different text to kind of highlight that mission of God, and, and today we look at one of my, my favorite texts, one of my favorite teachings that Jesus has, and that's the parable of the lost sheep. And have you guys heard that one before? Right? If, you've, if you've been around the church a while, you've probably heard the parable of the lost sheep before. If, you, if, if, if you're new, that's great. It's a great story. Like real quick, I want to go through that with you, right? There, there's a man who has a hundred sheep, right? And one of his good-for-nothing sheep, what does he do? He goes astray, right? He, he runs away and goes astray. And, and still the man has, has 99 of his sheep, Right? If I got a 99 on my test growing up, I was happy with that. But this man, he leaves the 99 on the hillside, on the mountainside, and he goes and he searches for that one lost sheep. And when he finds his lost sheep, he rejoices over him. He rejoices over the one that went astray. And I've probably heard that story, I've probably taught on this parable over a hundred different times. But something hit me different as I looked at it in Matthew's version of it here in Matthew chapter 18. And that was how, how, how God, how, how the man who lost his sheep rejoices over that one that was lost. That idea of rejoicing over the lost or rejoicing over the weak or rejoicing over the little one really stood out to me as I, I looked at the text this week. And that's really wanna, what I want to look at with you today is, is kind of dig a little deeper into Matthew's version of this and, and hopefully we can see how God rejoices over each one of us and he rejoices over each one of us that is lost. You see, Matthew at chapter 18, Jesus, Jesus is teaching in response to a question from the disciples. At the beginning of chapter Matthew 18, do you want to know what question the disciples asked Jesus? Some of you guys were reading along when I read it there. Right? They say, hey Jesus, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Right? Who's the best? Later on they're going to say, is it James or is it John? Is it me? Like, who, who is it? Right? But they, they want to know who's the best. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And you want to know what Jesus says? He says a child, right? First off, he doesn't say, well, look at that guy wearing all that fancy clothing over there. Look at that ruler or that king over there. Look at that religious guy that's getting all the rules and the regulations, right? He doesn't say any of those. But when asked who the greatest is, Jesus does this. He says, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He takes a child and he puts them in their midst and says, you must be like this child. For they are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And we in our 21st century American mind, we go, oh, that's so beautiful. Right? Children are a blessing. That, man, children are so sweet. Right? We feel that way when we see children. Right? When, when, when people see my kids around, they're like, oh, they're so sweet. I'm like, oh, if only you knew what they were like at home, right? <laughs> right? But, 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 but um, they're gone this weekend, by the way. I can say things like that. Um, but, uh, but no, they, they are sweet. We have this idea in our Western 21st century mind that children are, are sweet. And I think it's because of the teaching of Jesus. I think Jesus has changed how we view children because back in the days of Jesus, children were not viewed as blessings. Children were, were, were viewed as strains on your resources. They were build, viewed as hindrances, people that, that held you back until they could contribute to society. They were viewed as weak, as lowly, as people who didn't have their lives together yet. And so when Jesus is asked, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He says, you got to look like this child. Nobody would have ever expected that 
that Jesus rejoices over the weak child. And then he continues teaching with this idea of weakness, with this idea of a child being the greatest. And he basically says, woe to you, right? Woe to you if you cause one of these little children to stumble. Woe to you if you shove one of my sheep away, right? Specifically, he says it like this, woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptations come. In the context of welcoming the little children, welcoming the weak as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, he says, watch out. Watch out those of you who are tempting my little children, who are shoving them away. And I think that's a wake-up call for us, for, for those of us who are in the flock of God. Because how many times have we, maybe hopefully not willingly, but in our selfishness, and in our sin, cause one of these children or cause one of these sheep to go astray. I don't know, maybe, maybe for you it was somebody that you know and love and they, 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 they really let you down. Right? They really let you down. And not only they let you down, they messed up royally. And they came to you full of shame and guilt. Yet when they came to you, you saw how much they hurt you, how much they let you down. And rather than leading with forgiveness and grace of Jesus, you laid down the law, and you let them know that, that, that they were wrong, and you ended up shoving them further away. So now, when they look at you, or when they look at the God that you believe in, all they see is that condemnation. And they're now one of those lost sheep. Or maybe when you look at, at somebody like uh, who's sort of poor out there in society, rather than listening to the words of Jesus and saying, you know, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the humble, you, you look at them and go, man, I wonder what they did to mess up. I wonder what bad choices they made. And in doing that, you end up shoving one of God's children. You end up pushing one of God's sheep away. Because as Jesus teaches about this, he teaches about the, the value of the lost, the value of the weak, the value of the children. Right? He continues here, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. Right? God loves the children. God loves the weak. God loves the lost. So he says, see to it that you don't despise one of these little ones. God's heart is for the lost. God's heart is for those who, who don't quite have it all together. And then he tells the, the story of the lost sheep. He says, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the 99 that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. God desires the lost. God desires the one that went astray. Now think about that one that went astray, right? I don't know if any of you guys are farmers, right? We live in like suburban northwest Hillsborough County. Most of you I don't think are farmers. Some of you I know grew up on a farm. But sheep... With this one sheep that goes astray, whose fault is it? Is it the shepherd's fault? I don't know. The shepherds, 99 of them are doing what they're supposed to be doing. I'm like, like I said, if I'm the shepherd and 99 are doing what they're doing, I, I'm a pretty good shepherd, I think, right? 99%, like, that's an A, a plus in my book, right? Whose fault is it? The sheep. The sheep. The sheep got glitzy, glamorous, ran off over here, went off over here. The sheep, and, and it's interesting what Jesus, you know, what he talks about. He doesn't talk about like lions. He doesn't talk about elephants. He talks about sheep. And have you ever been around sheep? Are they very smart? No. Sheep are, are known to be like the dumbest animals around, right? Sheep, sheep are, are, are not very smart at all. I don't know if you guys remember a few years ago, there was a video that went viral on the internet. Maybe, this was probably like 10 years ago. 
right? And this, this sheep is stuck in a ditch. And this, this, this boy or this, this person, they, they go and they rescue the sheep out of the ditch. And it wakes up, it's like, oh, thank you so much. You rescued me out of the ditch. I'm never going to make that mistake again, right? You guys remember that video? Let, let, here, uh, Beth, I forgot to tell you. I have a video. I think it's going to play automatically, but um, I forgot to give you a heads up about this. I think it's, let's, let's, let's just try it here. Oop. There it goes. So he's going to rescue the sheep, right? He's stuck in a ditch. This good-for-nothing sheep is going to learn his lesson, right? Never make mistakes again. And... <laughs> right? You guys seen that one before? That, that's what sheep do, right? Sheep gets lost, they make mistakes, they get rescued, and what do they do? They go and do the same thing again and again and again. Yet, what does Jesus say about that one sheep that's stuck in the ditch? That one sheep that is lost. He goes out and he searches for him. Oops, now we're playing it again. He searches for him and he rejoices over it more than the 99 that went astray. Man, is that good news? I don't know about you, but, but I often find myself like that sheep. I go back to doing the same thing I know I shouldn't be doing. And I, I, get, I get rescued out of it. I put them like, oh, thank you, Jesus. Like, I appreciate your grace on that one. And then, you know, before I know it, I'm back in the ditch again. Yet when God finds me, he doesn't find me with condemnation. He doesn't find me with judgment, but rather he sends his son to die for me and rise for me that he might rejoice over me, even in my sin, even in my weakness. And that's true, not just for me, but that's true for all of us, right? That's true for you. Even if you find yourself constantly getting stuck in the ditch, Jesus leaves the 99 other and finds you there, and he rescues you, and he forgives you over and over again. He dies, and he rises for you, and when he finds you, he rejoices over you. And he does that also for those people that maybe haven't sat in one of these pews for a very, very long time. God's desire is for them. He searches for them, and he goes out, and when he finds them, as he's died and been raised for them, he rejoices over them, more than he rejoices over any of us that woke up and came to church this morning. It's beautiful to see God rejoicing over the weak, over the sinner that has been saved, I think that's something that's built into our DNA, and that's really what stood out to me, is how he rejoices over that lost one. And, and I think we can really feel that as God rejoices over the week. And um, this week I was on vacation, or last week, kind of into this week, I was on vacation. And uh, we were at the beach, and I, I, I left my phone up at the place we were staying, didn't take it with me, it was great. And on, on Monday, I got back up to the room we were staying in, and my phone had blown up with text messages uh, from a whole bunch of friends. Uh, I'm on kind of a group chain of, of friends from kind of growing up together. And um, there was a text message with a video that said, prepare to be moved. And I was like, okay, and all these people are commenting on it. Now, now to understand this, you need to understand the generation in which I grew up. And, you know, all of you guys were kind of around for that. Or most of you guys kind of were. I, I grew up as a child of, like, growing up in the 90s. So there was three movies that were foundational to who I was, who, where we burned out the VHS tapes watching them on Saturday mornings as a family together. Those three movies, you've already heard me talk about a couple of them, right? Those three key movies in my formation of who I am today. Number one, you guys, if you've been around here for a while, you know it, the best movie ever made, Christmas Vacation, right? <laughs> that will make a sermon sometime around Christmas time, right? That's not the movie I'm talking about. That is the greatest movie ever made, by the way. Second movie that was foundational to me was Top Gun, right? You guys make sense, right? Fast Jets. My dad had gotten us around sound system. We watched that movie like every Saturday morning. And the third movie, it's actually three movies, but was the Back to the Future trilogy. <laughs> Did you guys appreciate that? And I grew up watching and idolizing Michael J. Fox. 
and, 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 and he was who I wanted to be, you know, uh, Marty McFly, and, 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 and Michael J. Fox, as you know, he, like, the Back to the Future movies came out, and then within about five or six years after that, he got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And you guys have watched with me in culture every sort of cameo he, appearance he makes on a TV show or on a talk show. His health is just declining and declining and declining, and he's getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And the video that was shared with me this week was of a Coldplay concert from about a week ago. Anybody see this one? Right? And, and, and the Coldplay concert from about a week ago, uh, the band Coldplay, as um, they were playing one of their signature songs, they invited Michael J. Fox up, not in his strength, but in his weakness. And I think it's going to play in the background here. And he's up there in the Coldplay concert. He's got no audio, by the way, on this one. But he's up there in the concert in his weakness, in his wheelchair. And yet there are thousands of people, thousands and thousands of people rejoicing over him, even in his weakness. And I'd encourage you, whether you're a Coldplay fan or not, just to see people rejoice over somebody in their weakness is beautiful. And that's what God does for you and me. When we're lost in our weakness, God searches for you, and he rejoices over you, and he rejoices over your neighbor, and he invites you to rejoice in what he's doing as he's died and been raised for you, that you might always be his child that your neighbor, that that lost sheep way out there as well might always be his child. And I think that's good news. God rejoices over you. God rejoices over that lost sheep that is found. So let's end there. Amen. May the peace that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.